Hello everyone, welcome to the Exploring Mechanobiology podcast. We are from the Center for Engineering Mechanobiology. As a science and technology center, we aim to provide more resources to the science and education communities. This podcast is a part of our programs in science communication and social media outreach. And in this first episode, we will be featuring Ryan Calcutt and Richard Vincent as the, the outstanding CMB trainees of the semester. They are CMB trainees who just published their great collaboration research in science advances. They brought different, different expertises to this collaboration work, which Ryan is a plant biologist working in the Dixit Lab, Washington University in St. Louis. And Rich is a material scientist working in the RNZ Lab, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Through this project, they also collaborated with Derek Dean from Alabama State University to create the first artificial scaffolds that can support the growth of individual plant cells. Let's invite them to share about this exciting work and their journey behind it. Hi, Ryan and Richard. Hi. Hey, what's up? Very nice to meet you. Thank you for coming to our CMB podcast today. Happy to be here. Yeah. Tell us uh, some about yourself. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Ryan Calcutt. I'm from Washington University in St. Louis. I'm in my uh, 5.3, I would say, year of grad school. Six sounds like too many, um, but I'm in uh, plant microbial biosciences at WashU. Yep. And uh, my name is Rich Richard Vincent. I am a same 5.5-ish year PhD student. I'm in biomedical engineering, specifically uh, biomaterials engineering, a uh, PhD student at New Jersey Institute of Technology. I'm so very happy to have you both here. Like you're from different camp, different universities and different labs. And we're so happy to have you in, like to have your collaboration within CEMB Research Center. And yeah, it's, we see that you have a great research findings in recently in the artificial scaffold for plants which is i guess it's it's unusual because we already know like in tissue engineering we work with the cells animal cells and also the scaffold for animal cells but we haven't really seen any scaffold for uh, yeah artificial that, that was uh, one of the main goals of uh the CMB when it started actually was to try and get this technology off the ground for uh, for plants because the first uh, you know organ on a chip device for animals was in uh, you know 2009 2010 region and we started the CMB in 2015 2016 so we're actually uh, not as far behind as I uh, had once thought. And how did you start this research? Is it primarily your topic for your thesis so for me for me it is um this is my my thesis work um and it was really started as a sort of backup project for i mean not backup project for me but you know my first project was on uh, sort of protein biochemistry and i was doing this on the side and so my PI, Ron, brought me into the office and he said, we're going to do this project. Some people are going to start sending you um, materials. And I had no idea what that meant. So um, in the mail from one Richard Vincent, I received a bunch of different paper looking things. And then we had to decide what to do with that. Um, and eventually it became, you know, we our preliminary findings led to something that was really interesting. So we had to continue on. I'll let uh, Richard talk about what the uh, materials engineering part of it was like. So. Yeah. yeah, for me, it was kind of the same thing. It started, it's it's not my main work, um, but uh, it literally just started. My, my PI came out of nowhere and said, what do you think about plants? And I was like, I don't 
necessarily know what to say, I guess, you know, and she said, we're going to be doing some collaborative work. And she said, uh, we're going to try essentially to generate uh, the same kind of artificial matrices we make for our animal uh, stem cell studies uh, for plants. And uh, it's for me, primarily a side project. And um, uh, she just told me to electro spin like crazy. Everything we got, just electro spin it up. Uh, make a bunch of different matrices and let's just see what works and just I ship them out to Ryan and the rest is history sort of deal so yeah when we when we got them from that it was sort of like oh well shoot now we have to do something with these because you know we were Rich is a great collaborator and the Renza lab and the Dean labs in general are great collaborators they you know you ask them for something and the next day you receive it in the mail which is you know all you can ever ask for but we were expecting it to take a little bit more time. You know, we were like, oh yeah, we'll get this project started off the ground. And then uh, the next, in the next week I had a bunch of different things. And so we had to come up with a, a procedure to try and screen them. Um, and we looked at, there were some previous attempts to do this that were a little bit uh, unsuccessful in the sense that the cells didn't look normal, but um, it was very nice for me because that, that meant that that proceed, I could sort of use their procedure because I knew it worked to grow cells. Um, and, uh, fortunately it wasn't too difficult to, to screen all these materials. But it seems like you have a very like fruitful and productive collaboration. So you can make this, like, uh, this research to, to be published in science, which is really great. And I see that there's almost 2,000 uh, 2, times downloaded since it's, since it's, I guess it's uh, published in October 2021, which is just in, in three months. Yeah, the, the response has been really good, um, more than I expected. You know, you sort of, in your grad school career, you toil away at these these minute things in biology or in engineering and you think that nobody's going to care. So it's kind of satisfying to see people react and uh, want to engage with your work. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the things that I found out too. I actually wasn't, when we finished this up, I actually didn't think we were going to get any sort of recognition or, you know, that work was going to be recognized as sort of rapidly as it was, but it's pretty cool to see. Yeah, really good. And if we if we uh, go back in time, if like in which year were you when you were starting this project? Uh, it was the 2016-ish. Uh, was the first year that the CMB started. Oh, oh, oh cool! Like and have you met each other before? Not yet. Yeah. That was, I think, before the uh, that was before the first boot camp, where it sort of got started, and then. I think yeah, I think, so. yeah. I think so. Yeah, it was a it was kind of a cool way to you know interesting way to do things because at this point it wasn't on my radar really. Like I mean, I, I was doing we were doing the work in our lab, mm -hmm. and Richard was spinning things, but like you know at the same time this was just sort of something that our bosses told us to do. Um, it was kind of funny to arrive at the first CEMB boot camp the next summer uh, in 2017. And then like, oh, Richard Vincent, <laughs> that's the guy who sends me all this stuff. So, I was like, didn't I send you some things? You know, <laughs> what happened? I was like, what happened? Yeah. It was, it was kind of cool at the, you know, I remember being at our first uh, sort of poster session and that sort of thing and just being like, so like explain to me what's going on. <laughs> we were both like, <laughs> <laughs> but not neither of us know what's going on, but it was yeah, I, cool to figure it out together, you know. Yeah, I think we spent at that poster presentation almost an hour talking. I was like, so exactly what is going on here? <laughs> I was like, I made these. Here's how we make it. And then what do you guys do with it? And um, I think he definitely, like Ryan, like made most of those things clear to me exactly what was going on. And then afterwards, it was kind of easy just to you know maintain the work from there. Yeah. It's a unique, uh, it's a unique opportunity in the sense that, like most collaborations that you do with outside universities, you never get to really interact with the people other than over emails or things. So it was unique in the sense that you get to see the other person on the the other side of the collaboration who's doing the rest of the work that you're not doing, and 
it definitely helps uh, helps you appreciate that there's another person behind the collaboration too. Yeah, yeah, and it's I think it's also challenging to collab collaborate between two institutions like. You have distance, and it's kind of you don't see each other in person. But how how did you manage it? I think it was easy to communicate. Uh, we I guess the boot camp really, yeah, at the boot camp, I, we we were able to speak about these things very easily, and then keeping contact after that was really not a challenge, especially since we knew each other after that. And uh, I guess that's where it's also unique uh, in that I, if I needed some information. Uh, uh, from Ryan or, you know, what they potentially prefer us to make over here in terms of the geometry of the matrix that they wanted, he can give us that information. And then if we need a material, uh, if I need a material from uh, their lab, they would ship it over. It felt like overnight and uh, we can continue working back and forth. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, the, the key, the key to a great collaboration is uh, communication um, in general Um, I'm, we're fortunate that our PIs are good communicators as well, but uh, it's good to know exactly who's doing what and who's responsible for what part of the project. That really makes things, um, really simplifies things. So, and you know, I'm, I'm responsible for all the plant things, anything that has to do that needs a plant to interact with the scaffold, then that's me. And then if, I need, if anything needs to be made, that's, that's rich. Uh, yes. so it makes so, it it makes it much easier to have a good collaboration when you know, each of you know your roles. Yeah, because you also have different kind of expertise and you combine each other. Like it's gonna be yeah, it, it makes it a very great uh, collaboration. It's and, very com comforting as well to have the uh, sort of the over the umbrella of the CMB because I know you know, when they were creating this, that they wanted people that had expertise in lots of areas and they wanted the people in those areas to be, you know, the, the top of their field. And so coming into the collaboration, I know that, you know, these, these labs that we're working with are, are good. You know, we can trust them. You know, they were selected for this purpose to be able to do these things. So it's, uh, it's nice to have that, uh, the structure of the CEMB to, to help facilitate these interactions. Yeah. So we see also the, the strength of having the center, the CEMB center, and also how the, how the events and collaborations help us to be productive in research. And Ryan, you mentioned that this, this was not your main topic in your thesis, and it was like just like backup plan, but how, like, what makes you determine, like, this is my way, I choose this topic for my research. Well, I mean, it, it was it was sort of a right place, right time situation. You know, I, I was just the student that came in while we started the center, and so I started working on this. And then once we had some positive results, we knew that it was going to be sort of a big thing. So coming from the plant, the plant field, this is just something that doesn't exist for plants. Um, and even, even culturing of plant tissue or even plant cells is very difficult. And so to find a way that you can grow plant cells and uh, keep them alive for long periods of time, we knew that that was going to be um, a big contribution to the field. And so at that point in time, my, my um, biochemistry project was sort of lagging and it was a little bit boring, to be honest. And so I, I scheduled a meeting with Ram, my PI, and I said, hey, this stuff is really interesting. This, this, uh, this scaffold, this matrix stuff is incredibly interesting and I really enjoyed doing the work. So I just said, hey, I want this to be my, my baby, my project. And um, from there was, that was it. Yeah, and, your, uh, and your baby is growing up really well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, me. <laughs> can't wait till can't wait till it leaves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just kidding. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna be the absent parent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's interesting you said that because it's like, uh, from my experience, although like uh, the CMB project is not my main project, it's kind of like just the thinking uh, that usually uh, that we usually go through when we're sort of picking a project is like when we when you first start off. Um, Like, I know we all do really good work, but for me, at least I was kind of all over the place, right? I just didn't have a solid enough idea 
Um, but I did know I wanted to do something that was associated with like sort of chemistry and, uh, you know, moving that into BME and everything like that. And then after a while, you and your PI sort of go back and forth and you generate a focus. And uh, after you generate that focus, it's like, um, you are just expanding upon that. And then afterwards, that's sort of, um, that's how I, I, at least I sort of uh, came about my project and I had a bunch of things on the side. And it feels like, you know, it could have gone either way. You know, um, if one sort of side project was doing better, I could have needed, and since everything was all sort of relative to what we were doing in the lab, I kind of, I could have even taken that other route as well. But uh, sometimes it happens that way, you know, so I would say to the, especially the newer students, don't worry if you kind of feel like you're just like, walk, walk, like going in circles for the first year or second year, it happens. <laughs> and how did you manage your time with a lot of side projects? And also you also have your main project, Richard. <laughs> you bias something. Uh, so I don't know how it, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know how it was with you, Ryan, but it's like, you know, some of the, sometimes when you're a PhD student, it can feel like you're doing up to like five, six, seven different really important projects at the same time. So um, for my lab, it usually goes, you know, there's going to be, it's almost like seasons of the year, right? There's a part of the time, a time where it's like we're focusing on getting data for a grant or a time where we're focusing on getting data for a project or a time where, you know, we're doing collaborative work. We really need to get these things, you know, sort of finished in X amount of time. And the way you sort of manage it is to, I usually, you know, 80% bias one of them and then work little by little on the other projects until those sort of uh, maintain, you know, uh, most of your attention or when it's needed. So, um, and take time uh, for your main project and bias it when you need to, because it's really tough to, you know, finish all the side projects and then realize you're six, eight months behind on your, the work that's gonna actually get you finished as a PhD student. Uh, uh, and usually you know, communicating with my PI and all like the PIs associated with the collaborative work is really useful because they can say, all right, finish what, finish what we need for this now and then later on, you know, go for it, finish your work. Yeah, I would, I would agree with, uh, with all that. I, I definitely start with like, um, like I look at the, the week by week, like what do I need to get done on this project? And then how much time do I need to allocate, uh, allocate towards that? Um, but definitely biasing towards your own project. You know, there's a, there's a lot of conflict between, you know, what's best for you as a PhD student and what's best for your lab. And so you need to sort of, you know, you want to be a team player, but at the same time, you need, you need to take time to be selfish toward yourself and focus on your own things. And I think most PIs understand that, um, but it is, it is very important that you focus on, on yourself, uh, make sure that you're getting the things that you need to get done, done. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I agree with that. It's, it's important to uh, to have your main focus and it's also beneficial to have different side projects and it's okay to have an other focus yeah. as well. and uh, another point to uh if we're talking to to younger students as well that uh as you get older you get more valuable <laughs> you know you gain experience <laughs> yeah and then, uh, more and more people want things from you which is it's very nice it's nice to be a mentor and nice to to help out other people, but, you know, it becomes harder and harder to allocate your, your time towards yourself. Yeah. So talking yeah. to younger students, like where, if you get back in time, like before you, before you're being a graduate students, what were you, what makes you follow this page, follow this, like this field to mechanobiology from, let's say, since you're undergrads, what did you think about it? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, Ryan. Do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> sure. my answer is probably like not the answer people want to hear. I kind of just, uh, I guess for me, it was kind of as an undergrad, I was kind of nonchalant. I guess I wasn't the best student, just kind of all over the place. But I knew I had uh, interest in just doing lab work in general. So, whatever I could find, I thought it was cool. Um, so, it ended up that uh, I had a pretty uh, pretty decent interest in some of the 
uh, materials, uh, materials work that was being done on the stem cells here. But I was more interested in the chemistry that was being used and uh, I ended up doing a couple of reactions. So I was called a biomedical engineer, but primarily I was sort of a, like a polymer chemist sort of deal. Um, and uh, I wasn't really thinking about doing PhD, but I also just didn't know where I wanted to work, I guess, coming out of undergrad or if I wanted to work. So I was offered an opportunity to be a PhD student and I just said, sure, can I keep doing some of the same stuff <laughs> that I've been doing? And uh, that's sort of how I started. And then afterwards, the shift began where I can sort of like apply uh, some of the polymer, like organic chemistry to some of the sort of biomechanics and uh, biomaterials work that we're doing here. So uh, I guess I would say I just thought this stuff was cool uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to keep doing it. I don't know. I don't I don't have really a deeper explanation of that. I, don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think that's how, how a lot of science works is you just wander into the, into something that you're interested in for a little bit and then spend your time doing that. I definitely, you know, I didn't, when I was an undergrad, I didn't consider this as part of, you know, where I went to grad school or anything. This wasn't, this EMB wasn't even in existence yet. Um, so it was still something that I was unaware of. I wanted to do, um, biofuel work uh, when I went to grad school, but I took a rotation in uh, my PI Ron Dixit's lab and I really enjoyed the environment. And sometimes that's what it's about is uh, the people that you work with and the, the atmosphere that's in your lab. And I really enjoyed that. And then at the same time, when I came in, uh, you know, this grant was just getting pushed through and it was sort of an opportunity to, to be in something at the ground level. So you know, I was pretty excited about it when when it got funded and then um, excited to take take leadership roles in these sort of early stages of the of the CEMB. Uh, what I discovered now is that, uh, you know, I want to spend a little bit more time on my own research, but it's nice to be able to um, go be able to go back to that structure of the CEMB um, and sort of change in and out. So at the beginning, I was. Uh, I was the student steering committee representative um, and that was really fun because I got to be part of these very like informal meetings because at, yeah. at the time where none of us knew what we were doing. So was, even the PIs, <laughs> like, I'm sure they'll tell you they knew what they were doing, but I can tell you I was on the conference calls. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, uh, I, I remember but, those. You, I, remember, I remember one or two of those. You did a great job. Dude. Yeah. So it, it, it's a, uh, it's just the opportunity is really what led me led me here. It's, it's it's very fun to be part of something new and fun to be part of something exciting. Uh, that's the fun part. Maintaining your excitement about these things is the hard part. Yeah, yeah, especially when work starts building up, you know, and you have like five, six, seven different things to do. Sometimes you even, I even uh, sometimes, you know, uh, just played forgot that we had stuff like, you know, some things to, that we're going to sort of do for CMB sometimes. Because it can be a lot of work, but it's very, very fulfilling seeing this sort of, uh, seeing this sort of structure actually work and benefit, you know, my son and benefit us as, you know, PhD students. And it's helped, and it helps a lot, especially um, with different facets of work uh, in whatever you're doing. So it's always fulfilling. Yeah, I myself remember like I, during my first second year, I don't I don't even know what mechanobiology is. Yeah, and it's yeah. like I don't know where I could find this this like this the other research that can support my ideas. It's it's just like having you're in the middle of of the forest and you don't know which way to go. <laughs> Yeah. I think that the the keynote to take home from that is that there's always a way, there's always so many routes to go in science, right? Like we can yeah. do, especially with so going back to the research that is that we published. Uh, you know, I was I've been thinking a lot lately. Like we have this sort of um, these these not orders, but you know, the CEMB would like us to create microfluidics devices and. Uh, for plants and that that was the main goal all along that was the you know the pie in the sky idea but there are other uses of this technology that can be can be useful for our community uh, and so it's 
it's sort of weird to be at this stage right now where we have this, you know, we published this, this work and now we can do anything with it. Yeah. The problem is trying to pick which direction to go in that forest that you're, you're dropped in the middle of is I, I sort of feel brand new again in grad school where it's just like, okay, well, we finished this one phase, this big phase. Now what? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like you built a, built a road in the forest and more people behind you will follow you it's yeah like be, being like it it must be a lot of work but i i guess it's also impactful and give more benefits in the field yeah, i wouldn't uh i wouldn't go so far as to say to say that i that we built the road but we start, <laughs> certainly started uh we started wandering in a direction yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But there are lots of good. Uh, there are lots of good directions, is what I would say. I don't, I'd say you know, trust trust your instincts and follow what interests you, because you never know what's going to be at the end. Yeah, and I would say also, don't be afraid to sort of ask questions and talk to people. Like I, I when I first started this, I kind of thought there was a formal way to sort of get into contact with other professors, like other professors sort of outside of where I am at NGIT and. My PI yeah, was just, what are you talking about? Just email them. It's okay, just talk, you know, just go up and, you know, get to know, you know, get to know these people and see. Uh, and if you need any information, just ask, you know. So I've definitely learned a lot as a result. And it's just been, it's been, it feels easy at times, right? If I need anything, just be, do like to the way that the CMB is constructed. I send an email, I send my samples out got some carbon NMR analyzed and it took me no time or effort and, and anything like that. And if there was any information that I needed about the technique, I can just call it, you know, Dr. Faustin, you know, guys like that from Washington things. It was very, very simple for, it feels very, very simple. So I'd say, you know, make sure you take advantage of not only um, your PIs and the projects that you guys are, are doing as a part of it, but see what else, you know, branch out, see who else you can contact uh, and see what else you can do as a result of that. Yeah, but sometimes like because maybe I'm I'm more junior like in the early year of the PhD. Sometimes I just feel like I'm so small to and I don't I don't <laughs> I'm I'm really hesitant. That does to not go away. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I don't know. Does it go away, Ryan? I don't no, know. I mean, of... we're the we're the senior, uh, but uh, imposter syndrome is real. It's uh, yeah. it never as as far as I know, it never goes away. But uh, I think the thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, you are the world expert in the specific thing that you're doing. So mm -hmm. it's uh, that's one of the the, com the confidences that come with, uh, you know, publishing and getting your work out there and having it be accepted is that, you know, I know for a fact that I'm the only person on earth <laughs> who knows as much about growing plant cells on PBDF TRFE. Um, I know more about that than growing than anybody because I'm the only one who's done it. Uh, so whatever you're specifically doing, you know, you're the expert in, and that hopefully that gives you the confidence to go up to somebody and say, Hey, I need your help, or I need advice, or I, I want to show you this. Um, but yeah, the the feeling deep down of thinking that you're small, that it doesn't go away. You kind of just have to fake it till you make it. Even yeah, until Go for, sorry, go ahead. Even until your last year of the PhD, like yeah, it's like I'm defending in four days, and that feeling is still sort of in the back of my my brain. But at the same time, it's just it's just a feeling like okay, instead of uh, feeling like I'm sort of that so small and I don't know anything, it's like no, I kind of know everything there is to know about my project, but I know it from my point of view, and it's actually becomes pretty interesting to discuss uh, with people like different professors that are on your committee, uh, their points of view about your project as well. So it's less of the feeling that uh, you essentially are an imposter, you don't you sort of know enough, right? It's like, you don't know everything, but everything related to your project, um, you can at least give your two cents at the very least um, and have it be consistent with the basics associated with whatever field you're in. Um, so you're going to always be combating that little bit of fear, but at the same time, uh, it's interesting. It becomes more and more interesting to get different points of view um, related to your work at sort of later years, I guess. Yeah, whenever you're not like 
thinking about it as an attack. <laughs> yeah. Like whenever you're, whenever you're younger, or whenever you're earlier in your career and you do your you know thesis update or proposal or whatever, you know, you go into it and the professor asks you questions and you just think, oh, like I don't want to get any of these wrong. Like I hope I don't do any, I hope I don't mess up. And then eventually after you go through it a couple of times, it, it's less of like, oh, I it's not, I hope I don't get anything wrong. It's like, oh, you're actually asking this question because it's a useful like it's a different point of view than mine and thinking about things from a different point of view helps, uh, helps drive different directions of your project. Yeah, that's really great. And you also mentioned about the atmosphere behind you, how it drives you to, do, to this field. How do you think that your, your surroundings, especially in your lab, support you to be who you are now? Yeah, I guess I got lucky because I've sort of been here forever. <laughs> I did my undergrad here. Uh, and I've always sort of, I when I was an undergrad, I was, you know, I always wanted to do research and things like that. And uh, I literally just asked someone like, can I do some work? And Dr. Hammond, uh, who is in charge of sort of the chemistry sort of portion of uh, the overall lab work that we were doing, uh, just let me in and I've been working with these guys and getting to know them since undergrad. So uh, the picture to like the upper right is yeah, about three years ago. And uh, the two in the front I've known when they were PhD students and I was an undergrad and I really liked that in the environment, right? They were always helpful. They were, you know, they were direct when you were doing something sort of blatantly foolish, which was great, right? Um, but I, it, they sort of allowed me, even as an undergrad, to work. And I really sort of appreciated that. So it was a very easy transition to the sort of uh, graduate studies and uh, that sort of atmosphere where we're all, uh, uh, where we're not at all tense towards each other. We're, you know, more and less supporting each other. Uh, that sort of atmosphere was definitely beneficial and uh, because it would really not be so good if you kind of disliked them. So some people even said they hated the people they were working with. It's not, it doesn't make for a comfortable five, six years graduate study. So I'm pretty fortunate to have a good group of uh, people here uh, that, you know, very open and that definitely has helped. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the, to see the, the, the team pictures, the group pictures. Yeah. <laughs> it really shows how close you are to each other and how you supportive you are to each other. And tell me about this Dixit Lab also, Ryan, how it helps you with this. Yeah, the Dixit Lab. Um, it's, a, it's a great place, honestly. Uh, I mean, every lab has its ups and downs, um, but uh, it, it's been a, a great experience for me working with uh, Rob. And primarily that comes from, uh, you know, he's very excited about uh, he, like the ideas that we have in the lab. And that translates to us all being very excited about different ideas. So the, ex the free exchange of ideas is really what drives our, our research is just, you know, bouncing things off of one another and like talking about our research and coming up with different, you know, that different point of view. So you're talking about earlier with your, uh, with your committee, it's, it's nice to have more casual forms of checking in and getting other ideas. One thing that, I feel like people don't tell you is that your lab changes over time. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can, uh, you know, looking at these pictures is bringing back a lot of memories because I, I went from the most junior person in the lab to I'm now the most senior person in the lab. And that's a very weird experience being uh, the one who has to ask everybody where everything is and how to do things and that sort of thing to now being the person who knows, knows these things. It's a, uh, not something that you necessarily are prepared for, but it's a good it's a good experience anyway because you just sort of get thrust into into this leadership position or uh, you know the the elderly statesperson position in your lab. Yeah, yeah, and it's one of those. I don't know if you felt the same way, Ryan, but it's like one of those things that I noticed when I came into my lab in the beginning year. I felt like there was like a like a certain ex expectation of I guess like I guess. I guess it's called like excellence or like whatever uh, expectations of the way the lab is supposed to be handled and run and everybody's supposed to work. And when I was, when I first started, it felt like I was just getting bombarded with all of these sort of different rules and uh, 
uh, expectations of, you know, uh, quality and work and things like that. And it's like, like you said, all of a sudden now we're the leaders and now we have to like forward the lab, right? You know, and start teaching all, uh, all of the uh, newer students. And then next thing you know, they're going to be doing the same thing. So you do get thrust into that leadership role. Yeah, it's funny how the lab culture continues over time. Like, you know, yeah. our, our lab is, is, you know, I'm the only person left from when I started, uh, other than, than Ram. Uh, but the culture is the same, you know, the PI sort of sets the culture and then it gets carried on through practices of the, this is the way we do things in this lab. Um, but, you know, it's nice to have, it's just, yeah, I think nobody is anything without their lab because there are always times when, you know, something would have failed if it wasn't for another person in the lab coming to save your ass. So, yeah, yeah. all the time. Yeah, that's usually having multiple people watching each other's back is the way a lab functions relatively smooth. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times where I just left and I got a phone call like, Rich, you left this like heating at like 400 degrees. You might want to check on that. <laughs> so just like, yeah, it, it definitely comes in handy uh, when you have uh, a group of competent people sort of watching each other's back. <laughs> yeah. I, what I really like from our center is also having supportive mentors, supportive collaborators, and also uh, from, from, the, from the supportive lab members and colleagues and I, I also wanted to be one of the, those supportive per people. <laughs> you, you, you are, uh, you're your own person. So you'll be, you'll be whatever you're meant to be. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, and it'll be great. Mm -hmm. Seem to be doing just fine to me. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the next thing you know, you'll be leading the lab and it will be quicker than you expect. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thank you. So, Rich and Ryan, do you have any closing statements for other CMB trainees or like potential students in mechanobiology? Um, I would just say, uh, you know, make sure that you you take care of yourself. As Rich and I both said, you know, make sure that you're taken care of. Whether your main project is CEMB funded or not, make sure that you're, um, you know, you're taking time to do the things that you need to do. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, nobody's going to be looking out for you except for you. Um, but also, you know, enjoy, enjoy the benefits that, uh, that we have here. I, I mean, I would be, I don't know where I'd be without this collaboration because, you know, it's just not possible in other places. We, we don't have the resources to electro spin 24 different materials and then for me to test them all. Um, so definitely try and take advantage of the connections that you can make and the, the collaborators that you can have, but also, you know, make sure that you take care of yourself and uh, it's okay to shift um, if you're in a leadership role now or, um, or want to be in the future. Remember that it's okay to, to shift out of that leadership role if you need to um, focus on yourself because things do become more um your schedule, your time becomes more and more limited as you, uh, as you go on in your career. And, um, whereas you might have time to, to participate and be the model student in, uh, some periods, uh, you may have to take a step back and, and that's okay. You know, you have to focus on yourself and don't overstretch yourself. That's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah Ryan, those were two, like, like pretty god tier advice, <laughs> pieces of god tier advice you just gave, man. So, I guess uh, <laughs> it's gonna be hard to follow up after that one. Uh, but I guess, um, yeah, in terms of, I guess, in terms of uh, your uh, your own sort of uh, uh, lab work that you're gonna be doing, uh, I would say for newer students, there's always this sort of, uh, I guess. Uh, point of contentment between what they think is interesting and what they want to do versus what's beneficial to the lab and the center as, as a whole. Um, and sometimes that can uh, be problematic. Um, you know, so really, you know, a lot of people sort of treat their projects like their babies. Uh, and it's hard to sort of compromise uh, in such a way that you and your PI and the lab can benefit from your work and the field ultimately can uh, benefit from it. 
in general. So I would say try to compromise with, uh, and try to understand uh, uh, specifically uh, what you want to do with your pro like what you want to do with your project and uh, try uh, as quickly as you can to uh, align with what uh, you want to do and uh, what your PI needs you to do for your project and don't just look at every other sort of uh, interesting thing and try to test it out. It's wasting time and it's gonna waste your money and it's gonna waste a lot of money as well. Uh, so try to develop a focus uh, that you and your PI can uh, run, like can uh, take forward in the future. Uh, and the quicker you do that, you know, the smoother the experience, uh, the experience I guess grad school will be. Um, and I guess related to C and B, enjoy it. You know, I think one of the, one of the things that I, you know, wish I could do is go back you know, into some of the seminars that we had before, uh, you know, COVID hit, grab some more food, enjoy the locations a little bit more, you know, just like stuff like that, you know, and just like, you know, spend some more time. I, I understand it got stressful because, uh, you know, we all had our work to do, but when we were there, we were there and it was a good experience, you know, so definitely stretch your legs when you're, uh, when you're uh, going onto those different uh, uh, events with CMB, see who you can, see who you can meet, you know, see if you guys can uh, find, uh, like make a difference different friends and uh, find some uh, people who have capabilities that your lab don't, uh, doesn't necessarily have, communicate with them. And again, like uh, something as complex as CNMR, I have no idea how to run it, got it done and took me literally no effort. I just packed my samples and shipped it off to Dr. Foster, you know, and that was a result of just saying hello. So definitely enjoy uh, uh, the time and the people there. And uh, you guys should be, uh, uh, you're all very, very smart. You'll be fine. I'll add uh, add on to that that um, in my first in my second year the second year of the CEMB there was a, a, a international symposium on mechanobiology um, in Singapore and uh, since I was one of the the only people uh, at WashU the only students that was part of the center I got to go so oh. um, make sure you talk to uh, you know, figure out the leadership structure and make sure that you introduce yourself to uh, the people at the top of where you are. So, you know, right. you the, make sure that you're, you're speaking to Guy, Guy Gannon at these conferences and stuff. Guy is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't get, uh, you don't get a free trip to Singapore by being the person that nobody knows. So it's a good, it's a good piece of advice. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you for your advice. It's, I think it's really beneficial for, and it's going to be so helpful for younger students like me and other students as well. And I'd like to congratulate you all, you both, for your achievements so far. It's like publishing in science is not an easy peasy thing, but you did it and you did a lot of Well, thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>